Hey, good morning, Foundry Church. My name is Jeff Vanderbilt, and I'm the online venue pastor and ministry director here at the Foundry Church. And we're so excited that you're joining us for worship today, whether you are joining us from West Michigan, um, somewhere else in the state or country, or maybe even the world, welcome. Um, I'm currently standing in our worship space here at the Foundry. And again, just so excited that you chose to join us. If you want to stay connected and up to date to what's happening here at the Foundry Church, you can do so by texting the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and pressing the number one key. Um, and I just have also I have a couple other announcements to share with you this morning. Um, first being our devotional. Um, here at the Foundry Church, we are passionate about being in the Word of God, and we believe that we're called to be transformed more and more into God's image. So that's why we created these. These are our wisdom devotionals, um, and they were created by our amazing team of writers and contain the whole book of Proverbs, and will challenge and encourage you in your faith. And also for this season, we created these intersection pamphlets. Um, so what you read about in the pamphlets will get you prepared for what the pastor is going to be talking about on Sunday morning. So if you haven't picked up either of these, you can do so anytime by going to the West Doors in the airlock. Um, you can pick up a hard copy there. You can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, scroll down, and you'll find an electronic copy. Or if you live outside of West Michigan and would like a hard copy of either of these, just send me an email online at foundrychurch.net, and I'll make sure that I get one shipped out to you. I also just want to say thank you for your generosity to the Foundry Church. If you would like to give to the Foundry, um, there's a couple different ways that you can do so. You can uh, mail us your offering. Um, the address of the Foundry Church is up on the screen right now, or if you'd prefer to send it electronically, we have an option for that. You can go to our website, foundrychurch.net, click on the Give tab, and follow the instructions. Uh, I have one other announcement to share with you. Um, our youth here at the Foundry a few weeks ago, went up to Cran Hill and had an opportunity just to serve um, the camp up there in a number of different capacities. So I'm gonna turn it over to a video where you'll see some pictures of what they did and also just hear some testimonies of how God worked during their week. One thing I learned during friendship camp is how to follow God and how to worship and praise Him without caring about what other people think of me. I was watching these friendship campers worship and, and praise God and it's really quite incredible. They don't care what other people think of them. They don't care who's staring at them. God showed me that's really what courageous obedience is about. It's about following God, doing what He needs of me, even when people are staring at me. During the week, there are some times that were rather difficult for some of the campers. Most of their first reactions were to turn to us and ask us to pray with them. And it was just super cool because I feel like most of our reactions to something not going the way that we want it to is to like shut down or to be really frustrated. And they just wanted to pray to God with us. And I just thought that was really cool and that was a major God moment. That's it for announcements this morning. Um, let's open with a word of prayer. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we get to gather in this place and we get to worship you. No matter where we're worshiping from this morning, Lord, we know that you are there with us. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd give us open hearts to receive what it is you have for us this morning. 
And um, Lord, I pray that the things that we hear, they, that we would act on them, that the things you convict us of that need to take action, that we would take those steps. We'd take those steps of courageous obedience and, and just to dive deeper in our walk and our relationship with you. I pray for Pastor Eric this morning as he gives the message. Um, Lord, would you give him peace as he speaks and may, and may the words that he speaks be words that come from you. Lord, we love you. We turn this time over to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Your heart and 
it's Eric Zuber Incorporated. So you're sure that she's here somewhere in this park? Yes, I think she is alone. She said she'd be wearing a blue shirt. Okay, um, I'll keep looking. So what's going on exactly? She is a friend of a friend. She's been on the same road over and over. The thing is, some people she met basically told her it was okay that she was broken. Which, which is true. Right, you know I know that. I was a disaster when I met Jesus. You know what happened. I had no one, no friends. Everyone stayed away from me. You can imagine being the woman with seven demons makes you pretty unapproachable. I'm, I'm sure it had to be awful. But Jesus healed me. He freed me. He called me out of that life. This girl we're looking for, she's been told to share her brokenness, to be real, but she hasn't been said anything to her about being freed from it. They don't seem like they're really, you know, like true friends. No, she's been on the same broken path over and over. Uh, is, is that, that looks like her. And you know what, it doesn't look like she's doing okay. I know, just pull over, I will talk to her. If Jesus can make someone like me the first missionary, I can't imagine the joy that awaits this girl. It's okay, you can go, I've got this. I love this phrase, don't believe your own press. Don't believe your own press. What does it mean? It means this. Do not give yourself over to fickle flattery. This, this kind of syrupy kindness that is, is, is apt to turn violent as much as it is sweet. It is fickle, it's undependable, and it's flattery. It's not sincere. It's probably more for their gain than it is for yours. And it tells us, um, it's a reminder, don't give yourself to it. Don't believe your own press. And this is true for those who I think are, are in the press, but I also think this is true for the liars, for those gossips and critics who are always out there taking punches at anyone they can. I mean, the trolls, right, who see something and they just troll someone online. And no matter how good the news is, they're making horrible comments. They always find the darker side of a good story. And what I would say in this is that um, you need to not believe your own press, whether you're you're really doing some good things, or whether you're one of the liars, gossips, and critics out there, the reality is not believing your own press is a big deal. It's an important thing for us to lean into. And here's how I know it. I love classic movies. There are a number of classic movies that I really have enjoyed in my life. Um, but I will tell you this, many artists, many um, authors, uh, they have not been enjoyed while they were alive. Right? Like, there's so many, um, and I would think a lot of the Impressionist age artists, they, they died without recognition. And, like, nowadays, just the bitter irony that their paintings are selling for $30 million, and they're like, I died in poverty with one ear. Like, it, it's rough, right? They, you look at it, and you're like, in their day and age, they were, um, they were appreciated later, but forgotten when they were present. And, um, and I would like to look at a couple of first reviews with you um, so you could see how some of the classics were treated by the critics. It has dwarfs, music, tech, music, technicolor, freak characters, and Judy Garland. <laughs> I love that line. It can't be expected to have a sense of humor as well as... And as for the light touch of fantasy, it weighs like a pound of fruitcake soaking wet. Referring to The Wizard of Oz. I mean, one of the great movies of all time. And it's referring to that. Uh, this next one. 
I, I still can't believe this. It makes me so mad when I read this review. When Kevin's parents discover they've forgotten him, they find it impossible to get anyone to follow through on their panic calls. If anyone did so, the movie would be over. The plot is so implausible, it makes it hard for us to really care about the plight of that kid, Roger Ebert, on Home Alone. You look at it and you're like, how can you not love Home Alone, right? But but he missed it. It's a Christmas classic. Um, the next one, uh, this. Indeed, the weakness of this picture, from this reviewer's point of view, is the sentimentality of it. It's illusory concept of life. Mr. Uh, Kapara's nice people are charming. His small town is quite beguiling as a place, and his pattern for solving problems is most optimistic and facile. But somehow they all resemble theatrical attitudes rather, rather than average realities. Speaking of a movie that was a box office flop that you and I watch every year, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. When you look at these things and you realize that these are classics and they were panned in their day, they were not liked or, I don't know why, I don't know why this happens, but we love to let other people define us. Now think of that. We love to let other people define us and say things about us um, what, to, to kind of give us a sense of worth or a sense of, of economic, you know, interpersonal economic value in this world. And what happens is um, we tried, in, in writing this, we tried to find where the origins of don't believe your own press comes from. Where does that line come from? Who said it first? Who's that kind of historical marker that brings it up? And we couldn't find anything definite. And then we realized in the study of this that it actually is a sense of Jesus Christ. In John, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 24, it says this, Jesus would not entrust himself to them, the crowd, for he knew all people. He knew what was in the heart of people. He wouldn't trust his own press. They were following him and flocking to him and loving him and saying he's the Messiah, and he also knew they would be the people who screamed crucify him. Not all of them, but the majority would turn. So he didn't trust himself to all people. It says, um, it, it tells us that Jesus didn't believe the flattery. He didn't get into the flattery of what people thought of him. He didn't believe in what all the people were saying that was nice about him, which is super important. But here's the other thing he didn't believe. He didn't believe the mean people either. There is a line that happens when Jesus goes back to Nazareth, his hometown, for the first time. He goes back for the first time since he's really become this kind of cultural movement. And um, he goes back and he's in the synagogue, so his local place of worship in the synagogue, and he's given the the scroll of Isaiah and he reads from it. And, and afterwards, people could tell this man is anointed and called to do something. He spoke as someone who had authority. And um, when he does this, the line comes back to him. This is what they say. Isn't this Joseph's son? Now remember, Jesus was conceived in the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, and Mary was engaged to Joseph. And what they're saying is, yeah, isn't that Joseph's son, wink, wink, right? It's, it's just a slight on his character. It's to say, yeah, you are super important. Joseph's boy. It's just that needling, mean thing that goes on. So here's the thing. Um, people, people are mean. And I don't mean to, to assume the worst of people, but I will say this. People can just be mean. And they can be mean for no reason. And they can try to define us in the meanest and worst kind of ways. Because hurt people hurt people. That's just a psychological truth. Look into it. Talk to any counselor and they will tell you a person who's been hurt is far more likely to repeat that hurt into the next generation. Hurt people hurt people. And we who are sinful by nature have this problem with hurting people because we're constantly defending territory in our life. And there's just going to be people in this world who are really, really mean. And we need to prepare ourselves for it. 
And a lot of times the mean people are the ones who flatter us with the sweetest words. So I want to talk to you about keeping good company. What does it mean to be in good company, right? Like if you walk in uh, to somebody's house and, um, and ever, the kids are there and like you're hanging out with people and there's, let's say there's steaks on the grill but there's also hot dogs and you're like this, I really like hot dogs. And somebody else is like, well, then you're in good company. Because they like them too. They're saying we're together in this. What does good company look like? I love the Jesus Storybook Bible. It's a Bible that um, we give to all our families when their children are baptized. And we give it to them because it is a great, um, biblical, faithful biblical marker. And it, and it walks us through the story of Jesus through all of Scripture. But it does something really cool in this. It makes it clear to kids that the Bible is not a story of heroes and perfect people. It actually goes to great lengths to explain that people are really broken. And I wish I had understood that when I was little, that these, these people in Scripture, the stories of people, are not about the perfect people. Some of them are heroes of faith. But there are also people in there who are supposed to be um, you see their brokenness as well as their strengths. I wish I had seen that. It tells the story of people, just people, neither great nor small. They're just people, people that God loved and people that God redeemed. And we have to understand that, that, there are, that that's the classification. It's not good people or bad people. It's people that God loves and people that God redeemed. Broken, badly broken people who God used for his glory. So if you have been, if you have been a horrible, broken, mean, selfish, liar, sinner, and um, just kind of cruel person at times, I want to invite you to good company. You're in good company. You're with other people who God has redeemed and used for his purposes because they submitted their life to his lordship and he conquered their sinful nature for his glory and purposes. So when we look about, look at this, it isn't about where you started, it's about where you finish. I mean, the book of Kings is literally, if you want to title the book of First and Second Kings in the Old Testament, I would say that is the title. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. It's not how it begins, it how it, it's how it ends. So I would say that since since we talked last week that it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to stay there, we should look today and remember that if you are in Christ, you are a new creation, the old is gone and the new has come, and you are living this new life. But what if you believe that? What if you believe that you are a new creation, the old is gone and the new has come, but, but they don't? What if they don't believe it? That's the hard part, because people define us. People really define us. And if you, like me, have a past where you know maybe you don't deserve the, the unmerited favor of God, and you feel a little bit out of your depth in life, I'll be honest, sometimes I wake up, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a pastor. This is shocking even to me. Not because I'm a horrible person. Well, actually, because I'm a horrible person. Apart from Christ, I'm the worst of sinners. And even in Christ, there are times where he's having to refine me and work things through me. So what if you believe that you are a new creation and that the old is gone, but the new has come? What if you believe it, but they don't? Quite honestly, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what they're speaking of when it comes to who you are in Christ. If the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. That's what John chapter 8, I think verse 36 tells us. If the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. And even experts miss the mark on their reviews at times. Even the, the best and brightest of people who know culture will review the Wizard of Oz wrong. And they'll think Home Alone is a Christmas flop that will be on the shelves of the B-roll and never used again and be dead wrong. And I want to say this to us today because we need a word of encouragement that, that what they think of us actually isn't the truth. And they're not right in it. Look at Mary Magdalene from last week. Look with me at her, possessed by seven demons, freed by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and one of the faithful to stay with him through his, his trial all the way up to his death as he was crucified. She was right there with him. But what happened next? What happened next? And I think that's what we have to lean into because we serve a God who's doing something next. He's doing something from glory to glory. He's refining us. He's transforming us. He's using us for his glory. What happened next? Early in the morning on the third day, this moment early in the morning on the third day, John and Peter had gone into the empty tomb and ran off, but Mary stayed behind. And she was brokenhearted. She couldn't conceive of the idea that Jesus was resurrected. She thought somebody had stolen him, taken his body. It says this in John chapter 20, verse 11 to 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb and she was crying. As she wept, she bent over to look inside the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Oh my goodness, there's so much Old Testament theology there. It just the, the mercy seat and, and the, the angels and the Ark of the Covenant, so beautiful. I mean, I don't know that, that she understood what she was seeing, but, but it was such a big moment. And, and the angel says to her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was him. Now, just take a moment with me. Just take a moment with me. She's in a very dark tomb, and she turns back to the only source of light. Have you ever taken a picture and made the mistake of the person in the picture, like, Standing there like that, but behind them is a window, so all you get is a cutout of them. Because the light isn't illuminating their features, it's actually casting them in shadow. So she turns and she sees this figure standing at the door, which personally would terrify me if I'm in a tomb and someone shows up there. But anyways, she turns around and he asks her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking she, he was the gardener, she says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. He called her by her name. And she turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, Rabbi, my teacher. She calls out to the impossible. What's happening right now, her brain can't even conceive of. But before, uh, in a blink, all of a sudden she, she confesses what her mind can't believe, her heart can't keep quiet. Rabbi, teacher, and Jesus said, don't hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to the Father, to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had seen, she told him what she had seen. And here's the thing. She tells him these things, what Jesus had said to her, and her life is transformed, not so much because, um, because she was worthy, but precisely because she's the perfect example of someone who shouldn't be the first missionary. The first missionary should be Mother Teresa. The first missionary should be Billy Graham or Peter or John or Jesus' mom. It should be anybody but a seven-time possessed woman from Magdala named Mary who, yes, Jesus freed, but, but she was, she's a woman. She doesn't hold any cultural value in ancient Israel. She's property. She's just somebody. The critics would say this is totally impossible that a woman would be the chief and first missionary to go and tell the men what she had seen when the men had been there and took off running. It's impossible, and not only that, not only is she a woman, she's been possessed by demons. She is thoroughly unqualified for what she is about to become. But Jesus says, go and tell my brothers that I am ascending back to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Go tell them what you have seen. Go tell them what I have, I have said to you. 
and she becomes the first missionary. What an honor to be chosen first among all the gospels, among all the story of scripture, among all of history. The first person who Jesus says is worthy is someone who is probably worse off than you were when she met him. I love that reality. I love that it wasn't the apostle John. Jesus chose the woman who had been that girl. That girl. The one you're like, there's no way God could use her. There's no way she should be anything other than a back row person in the gospel narrative who doesn't get prime footing because, well, she needs to sit in the back and be quiet because she has been saved for much. And Jesus is like, exactly. She has been saved by, from much. Many sins. <clears throat> and his redemption rolls over those sins. And his identity takes possession of her. When I say that, that his, his identity, his person took possession of her, she freely gave herself to him, but he took her, he owned her. He gave her all his value. He conferred onto Mary the authority of who he is. And I think this is important. Jesus is showing us in this that it's not about who we were. It's about who he is. Hear that today. It's not about who you were. It's about who he is. Who is he? He is the Lord, the Savior, the author of creation, the one whose image you are made in. He is altogether all sufficient, our Lord, our Savior, and our God. So when we look at this, we understand that we can't let our past define us, but that comes so easy to us. We remember so clearly who we were that we forget who he is and who he called us to be. No one should have believed Mary Magdalene. No one should have taken her seriously except for the fact that she, a woman who suffered with demon possession, had been completely restored by Jesus Christ. And even if they would have believed her, even if the disciples would have believed her initially, there should have been that background of who she once was that said, but can we believe what she's saying? Who knows that she's not having another weird spiritual moment? But they believed her. They believed her. And, they, and not only did they believe her, but her original testimony rolls down through the ages historically as a marker as the first person to declare the wondrous resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. For, two, for over 2,000 years now, we live in the age of the church. And the first breath of the church as a human being speaking it out was Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, a person who would have been defined in our culture, their culture, and any culture as not the poster child, except for one thing, Jesus disagreed. Jesus disagreed, and I want to say something to you, and I want you to hear this today. He disagrees about their opinion of you, too. You're going to tell me all the reasons why you're not qualified, and Jesus will say, I disagree. I disagree. His blood his spirit and the claim of him on your life as a Christian disagrees with the world's opinion. And he will use you as he sees fit for his glory, not yours. So don't allow him, uh, don't allow them to define what he has done, what he has made, and his purposes. Philippians 3.13 says it this way. Brothers and sisters, this is the Apostle Paul. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, and this is super important, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. Do you hear that? He ha Paul says, I have to forget what, what I've done in the past because of what I'm called to do in the future. I must forget what I was, that is ever before us, isn't it? It's always before us. And the problem with that is it carries weight in our heart and our soul. It is so hard to forget who we were, to forget the past, to forget the willful, sinful, arrogant behaviors that stood in opposition to God. 
It is hard to forget our past. But if we don't forget our past and we don't commit our past to the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory on the cross, we will live a life that is held captive by our past and it will cripple our future going forward. We have to be a church, individuals collectively gathered who understand that our past sins are beyond description, but our present hope is not rooted in that. It is rooted in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ does not bend or falter to their opinion. He doesn't bend or falter under their opinion. And the the problem is that the criticism can be withering. It can absolutely destroy you. It can feel like, um, like you're carrying a million pounds of shame and guilt. And the reality is this. We begin to carry dead weight. We just pack it around. I'm, I'm gonna actually give you an example of this. Come here real quick, Matt. Um, Matt's gonna come up, and I don't think Matt is dead weight. But yeah, let's be super clear on this. But, but hang on one second, come here. All right, I'm gonna hold you like this. All right, now you just go to sleep. So here's the thing. I'm not super athletic, but if I'm carrying around this, I think about 85 pounds is what I'm holding. Um, um, If I'm carrying Matt around while he's this, and I've got basically a human backpack, here's the problem with it, church. I can do far less with him on my back than I could if I cut the dead weight free. But you've got to cut the dead weight free. If Matt represents my past and my failures, the fact is that for this to be on my back hinders and prevents me from living living fully into the calling I have in Christ. And the reality is this, you have dead weight on your shoulders. We can take it off every once in a while, and then we'll look at it and go, no, I want to pick that back up again. I want that over my shoulders. But the fact is this, if you're carrying the dead weight of your past, you're doing so because you believe God's required a penance of you that he hasn't. God doesn't want your past laid on you, he forgave it, he redeemed you, he called you out of your past into his future, and he calls you into the, to live in a new identity in Christ, not in you. It's Christ in you that is the hope of glory. That is your hope, that Christ has moved into you by his spirit. So when I tell you don't carry the dead weight, I don't tell you that for any other reason than this. It's the compassion of the gospel that says don't carry that which Christ died to relieve you of. He has cut away the bonds and the weight of your sin so you can live in the freedom and the hope of his calling to be made into his image and courageously obedient to wherever his spirit calls you to be. Friends, don't believe your own press. Believe the one who while you were a sinner died to save you from those sins. Believe the one Believe the Lord Jesus Christ and what he says of you. How did that song go? I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are dearly loved, a child of God, called according to his purposes for his glory. Hold on to that. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you and thank you for who you are and the work you're doing in us. I pray, God, that as we, your church, tune our hearts and our ears to this, that it would be a word that encourages us. Thank you, God, that so many critics got the classics wrong. And thank you, God, that in your kingdom, we're all classics. We're all people who have a rich and wonderful story to tell. And it's the story of you, Lord Jesus Christ, forgiving a sinner such as ourselves. We love you. We thank you, and we are overwhelmed at your grace and goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. So I don't know what things you have experienced in your past. I don't know what brokenness or what hardship. But what I do know is that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we no longer have to listen or are defined by those things because our identity becomes in Jesus Christ. And if we look at the life of Mary Magdalene, we see somebody who was possessed by demons and and who struggled for many, many years. But then when she came and met Jesus, he redeemed her and he called her out of that. And her identity was no longer found in the past. Her identity was found in Jesus Christ. So my wife and I, we have this little um, sticky note on her fridge. It says, audience of one. And it's just a reminder to us that, that we are not defined by the things of our past. We're not defined by what other people say, but we 
Our identity is in Jesus Christ and what he says about us. He says that we are loved. He says that we are his children, that we are accepted. And those are the things that we need to believe. And that is who we are in Christ Jesus. So I just encourage you this week to just remind yourself that your identity is found in Jesus Christ. And as you go from here, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you have a prayer request or would like to pray with somebody this morning, you can text the keyword Foundry Online to 94000 and press the number three key. Other than that, I hope that you have a great day. You're able to get outside and enjoy the beautiful summer weather we've been having. And uh, I look forward to joining you again next week as we come together and worship again.